Hi, it's Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. It's March 4th. Um, I believe it's, what is it? It's Friday. And today's topic is sort of the Hollywood arm of the intelligence services. Um, while I have been working on my newsletter, the Epstein Project podcast, sorry, the Epstein Project newsletter. And by the way, before I start, like the video, like the video, because, you know, I do get totally carried away. I don't ask you to like, but like it and subscribe, please. Um, so I have come upon a lot of information, as you know, um, in my newsletter of several weeks ago, I connected Jeffrey Epstein uh, to Sidney Gottlieb's uh, program, uh, the Lolita Project. Um, and of course, he went on to name his plane the Lolita, and then we have this whole theme of minors and the child trafficking. And of course, I've written a lot about the Franklin scandal, which is, I believe, part of a very large ongoing um, trafficking situation that's been with us, not just in the United States, but in other major countries like the UK and Ireland and Australia for, you know, for a very long time. Um, what happened was I stumbled upon some information connecting a victim of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, connecting her to an actor that achieved uh, some success, in fact, a lot of success in the UK um, and connected her to this man who was 40 years her senior. And I'm not gonna name names uh, in this podcast. And then his information led me to the fact that he was supposed to be at Sharon Tate's house, uh, Sharon Tate, was a beautiful woman who was murdered by uh, the um, followers of the Charles Manson uh, cult. And Charles Manson, as those of you who have read my work, um, it, you know, he was an MK Ultra uh, victim as well. Um, I've also discussed other people as being. Um, MK Ultra victims, which has been substantiated. So Ted Kaczynski, um, it has been substantiated that while he was at Harvard, he too was a an experiment, let's call it. And um, also David Berkowitz. From what I can discern, David Berkowitz was definitely part of the MK Ultra program, and I believe a lot of these. Uh, Mark Chapman, the, the man who murdered John Lennon, I, I believe was also connected to the MKUltra program. And um, today I'm going to be uh, discussing how um, someone like Roman Polanski, Ira Levin, and other people are also connected to this program and have knowledge of. So the basis of the program, which was discovered uh, in 1974 and it sort of outed to the public by Seymour Hirsch in several New York Times articles uh, because he had gotten from uh, someone in the CIA, and again, I'm gonna just keep his name out of it for the time being, uh, gave him a sort of like a 600 plus page internal document showing the, um, list upon list of, of uh, things that had not been disclosed to the public, but that were actually criminal, that were criminal in terms of what they were doing to just average citizens. So for example, uh, sending uh, fake letters to Martin Luther King. Um, so like that's before social media. Now we, we see fake uh, Twitter accounts pretending to be whoever and, and posting all kinds of fake information. So disinformation. And, and so that's what it was. It was a counterintelligence program meant to discredit 
uh, the person in this case, um, Martin Luther King and anyone that uh, J. Edgar Hoover or the CIA or the president decided was a threat. Uh, among those threats we know was later on John Lennon was considered a threat. We know what happened to him. Um, and uh, so the program basically, if we're going to just uh, go to the baseline, it's about masters and slaves, okay? So we have the masters of the universe and we have slaves. And the way that someone gets fame, uh, money, fortune, succeeds in his or her field is I've discovered they have to sacrifice something. So um, it's multi-generational, as I've said, for almost three years now, but it goes back much further than World War II, which is where a lot of uh, researchers sort of like use as their starting point. Now, this goes back much further in time. And um, in my Epstein Project newsletter, which is a subscription newsletter, because there's a lot of stuff that I can't tweet and that I can't put up in a public area. So it is a subscription only. It's in my, I'm going on my third year, which is amazing to me. Um, but it's also the reason that I, I'm able to write so many books because I'm always researching and I'm always um, speaking to uh, former intelligence officers, whistleblowers, and people that, you know, are in the know, sort of, you know, that hung out with, let's say, Mia Farrow, who ended up being in Rosemary's Baby, who was married to Frank Sinatra, and I'll be talking about her uh, as it pertains to Rosemary's Baby. Um, and also, even let's say someone as uh, benign as uh, Vidal Sassoon. Well, Vidal Sassoon, in every one of these um, trafficking situations, there's a hairstylist. So that with Jeffrey Epstein, it was, um, oh, his name escapes me, but it, it, he was part of this. And it, one of his perks was that he got to a um, very good looking guy. Hopefully I'll, I'll either find his name in my work here because I've got some notes obviously, <laughs> um, or I'll just add it to the area down, down below the uh, podcast. And then um, during the uh, 1960s and 1970s, that person was Vidal Sassoon who was in fact financed by the Rickless family. And those of you who have read my memoir, The Billionaire's Woman, know that, you know, about the Rickless family. And in this case, they used Marsha Rickless, uh, the daughter and Ira's sister, Michelle and Rickless's daughter, to finance uh, Vidal Sassoon. They, it's sort of kind of to keep it all in, in the family, to keep it um, so that they can send uh, what I'm going to call the victims, you know, they, they recruit people and or it's multi-generational, as I said, it, it is connected to the government, uh, but there's, there is a layer of um, sacrifice and that sacrifice is known to be satanic. So, um, the Hollywood connection, um, one of the movies that Michelle Rickless made uh, with his teenage bride, uh, Pia Zadora. So he was in his 50s when he met a teenager, uh, Pia Zadora. And it was at that time that he left his wife, uh, whom he had, you know, been married to for a couple of decades. And um, he married Pia Zadora. Again, she was a teenager. Uh, she had been a child actor. You know, every time that we see child actor now, I think you have to pay closer attention. So one of the films that he 
uh, sponsored. Uh, and you won't find his name, by the way, in any of the Wikipedia links because it's been scrubbed. Um, so he did shampoo with Warren Beatty. Um, he did a lot of other films um, that you won't find his name connected. I know because I was in that sphere for eight years. And of course, the ongoing um, harassment and of course being kidnapped and almost being killed and being shot at while I'm walking down the streets of New York, um, you know, is stuff that continues to present day. Uh, obviously, I'm always looking for answers and, you know, it connected to the Epstein situation uh, and, and this is where I am. But before this, um, commencing from, for like 20, 20, a little over 20 years, I, I was a real estate uh, consultant, a real estate professional. And so I, I do have information about uh, the historic Dakota, uh, which is the location that was used by Ira Levin uh, for Rosemary's Baby. So when they were filming, they used the exterior uh, and they actually filmed it somewhere else. Um, and I'll be getting into that. Uh, but to get back to Michelle and Rickless and Piazzadora, uh, one of the films that they made was a film called Butterfly. And it's a very weird film. Number one, the name Butterfly is already the symbol and, and of MK Ultra. And Butterfly has two wings and it's and it's a symbolic of a brain that has been split in two. So the goal of Sidney Gottlieb's uh, program, which you know is like what they were doing in Nazi Germany uh, on the prisoners and the experimentation on the children and specifically they like siblings. Uh, they like siblings, but they also really like twins, but siblings is the next best thing um, is to take um, a person split their personality so that one personality is then capable of murder because it's all about blackmail and um, espionage. And while a child, and I'm going to call anybody under 18 a child. So for you to know what I perceive of as a child is anyone under 18. Uh, when they take a child, and in some cases, that child is 10 years old, um, but it could be 12, the child could be 14, so on and so forth. So they take a child and, and they will use that child for uh, sort of, you know, carrying drugs, because who's going to think that a 10-year-old child or a 12-year-old child is going to have drugs on them? So for mules, uh, they use that child to uh, sexually compromise uh, powerful people. And um, so if captured, because this is war, you know, they're soldiers of war, um, the, uh, the MK Ultra, and, and MK Ultra, again, I use it as a, as a um, sort of like a headline, because there are like thousands of programs underneath it. Some of you are familiar with Monarch. And Monarch is the creation of the sex slave. Um, so while the, if you're caught, then the other personality, uh, the person that used to be you or perhaps a new identity will show up and will have sincerely no knowledge of ever having done anything wrong. And so you avoid being captured, you avoid being killed, and it's used by the military. In uh, the upcoming Epstein Project newsletter, I dive uh, really deep into um, firsthand accounts of being trained at a certain Air Force base and what happens during training uh, by someone who experienced it firsthand. Uh, in the 1980s. And so 
uh, if you're not a member, it's kirbysummers.com uh, newsletter forward slash newsletter. And I urge you to subscribe. I had to, you know, sort of, I, I, I do have a caveat. I sometimes don't accept everyone who subscribes, even though they're, they're offering to pay me. I'm very careful about who I share this information with. And also uh, for the monthly membership, if anyone tries to su subscribe for one month, it's a three month minimum, uh, then I just permanently ban the person because I don't really want a looky loo who just wants to come see my research. My research is based on personal experience. And I've been doing this now for three decades. You know, I've been looking for answers to my own situation for three decades. And so it's, it's, it's new research. Um, and it's not for someone who just wants to take a look at what I'm doing. So if you're serious about this topic, if you're on the right side, meaning our side, the good side, good over evil, then you're welcome to, to become a subscriber. If you're on the wrong side, I'll eventually find out and I will ban you forever. You know, I have no problem, as many of you know, uh, blocking people on Twitter. I block maybe 100 or so accounts every single day. You know, it's, it's for me, it's about let's just get a bunch of us good people so that, you know, you become knowledgeable. And with this knowledge, we have a chance at overcoming and and interpreting some of these films so that let's say in the film butterfly it's about this teenager uh who finds her long lost father played by stacy keach and um seduces him so right there we have the uh the incest right and the fact so what they're doing is they're desensitizing the public so that if a father wants to have sex with his daughter or even his son, that these films, you know, they seep into your, into the deepest recesses of your mind so that when it happens, if, it, if you hear it happening to someone you know, or you have it happen to yourself, you don't think you're all alone. Uh, it's, oh, this must be normal. And we've heard some of the Jeffrey Epstein victims say, I thought it was normal, right? Because they don't have another frame of reference. But no, it's not normal to have sex with your father. And so that is what uh, the film Butterfly produced and financed by Michelle Rickless for his teenage bride, Pia Zadora, was all about. Um, she's, it's, she's portrayed as a nymph who seduces her father. Um, I should say that Michelle M. Rickless um, also took under his wing Michael Milken. Michael Milken, if those of you who don't know, there's a lot of it has been scrubbed, but Michael Milken was uh, in the 1970s uh, known as the junk bond king. Um, Leon Black was his right-hand man. Uh, Leon Black now owns Apollo, and he is connected to Jeffrey Epstein. This, all of these people are connected, you know, so that even Polanski is connected. Ira Levin is connected. Stanley Kubrick is connected. The NASA scientists uh, are connected to the Nazi scientists. There's, it's just one big connection. Boys Town is connected. Charlie, Charles Manson was sent to Boys Town at the age of 14. It, all of this is, they're, they're all layers of the same, of the same thing. Um, and so uh, it sh I, I just want to make sure to note that President Donald Trump uh, pardoned Michael Milken, who was known as the junk bond king, and he ripped off billions of dollars doing insider tradings that were illegal. And uh, he was sent to jail and he was probably the first person to use, um, he tried to bribe Connie Brooke who wrote about that experience. 
she wrote about it on the financial level. She didn't get deeper into the nefarious aspects of where that money was going. And I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, but he offered her a, a million dollars not to write her book, uh, The Predator's Ball. Um, someone else who wrote a really uh, good book about Michael Milken was, um, oh, gee, I, you know, I wasn't planning to talk about Michael Milken, but, ah, uh, all right, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, anyway, during that time, there was another producer that some of you might be more familiar with, and his name is Arno, Arnon Milchin. And um, Milchin, uh, some of his films are Pretty Woman, LA Confidential, and Fight Club. And in 2013, he was outed as, as a Mossad agent for Israel. Uh, he was an arms dealer. Um, he used his cover as a film producer to acquire nuclear secrets for Israel. And so using uh, Milchin as, um, since you could, you can Google, or I would suggest using another um, search engine, any search engine, not, not, not don't use Google, but in any event, you can find information on Arnon Milchin uh, as being connected to the Mossad and having been a spy and helping them with nuclear secrets. Um, he was recruited by the former prime minister, uh, Shimon Perez, and uh, connected to Arnon Milchin, and in fact, included in his films, Kevin Spacey. So Kevin Spacey, we know is an insider because we've seen him at Buckingham Palace with Ghislaine Maxwell and Bill Clinton. Uh, he, he and Ghislaine are sitting on the thrones. Um, so Sidney Pollack is also a, a connection of Milchin, as was Rosemary's Babies, uh, Roman Polanski and Ira Levin. And so these are insiders. And Sidney Pollack, if that name is familiar to you, was not just a film producer, but he starred in um, Eyes Wide Shut uh, that was made by one of my favorite guys. Well, I'm just going through my notes here. You know what, let me just go back one second to um, in an interview uh, that Israeli President Shimon Peres did in 2010, uh, he was talking about Arnon Milchin and he said, Arnon is a special man. It was I who recruited him uh, when I was the ministry in the Ministry of Defense. Uh, Arnon was involved in numerous defense related procurement activities and intelligence operations. And he's, his strength is in making high level connections. Okay, so the ability to be gregarious or to like, let's say somebody like Glenn Maxwell, that's her strength. To make high level connections. Glenn Maxwell was born to Robert Maxwell, who was a spy. In fact, at the time of his death, he was considered Israel's super spy. Um, there was a book written about Robert Maxwell, in fact, called Israel's Super Spy. Um, he had made all of these connections and he introduced Ghislaine Maxwell. If those of you who have read my book, Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography, will know how he then introduced her, not just to the presidents of the United States, but to the heads of countries. In addition, of course, to everyone who was important in Israel. So um, with uh, Arnon Milchin, he shows us he, his connection to Sidney Pollack, who shows up in Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, which was a film that Kubrick made. And then he died, what, two weeks later? He couldn't even finish 
uh, producing, and I'm not going to get into that film specifically, but that film does show us the underworld. And it, it, it's so um, widespread that, quite frankly, I, it's not our underworld, it's our overworld, because remember, it's masters and slaves. We, the regular people, are considered slaves, and they who are in charge, who have knowledge of the mind control programs, who disperse the medication to our children uh, in various ways. Because, you know, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as kids taking drugs. And now kids take drugs all the time. Um, these people they don't necessarily take these drugs because they want to remain very level-headed. And this is something that Ira Levin wrote about. And what's interesting, and I will be getting to that very soon, is that that's the one book he could not get published for a long, long time. Why? Because it said the truth about where the world was going. So what the overworld has on the rest of us, I'm gonna call us slaves for the time being, is that um, they know they have a long range plan. And so it is carried out in very small steps so that we are not really made aware um, so that we go along with the plan and, and we follow kind of the script. We don't ask too many questions. Uh, those who do ask a lot of questions, let's say someone like Martin Luther King, uh, who was really promoting uh, what was a long overdue, uh, everybody's life matters. It doesn't matter where, you know, the, the color of your skin. Um, it, it doesn't matter where you're born. It does, it's just, if you're a citizen of the United States, everybody should be treated equal. To present day, that's not true. Um, but so somebody who raises awareness is considered literally an enemy of the state. And there was a movie made of, of that. Um, so with his eyes wide shut, and in fact, all of his films, someone like Stanley Kubrick, who was in the know, who was part of this world, uh, we have seen a, a famous photograph of Stanley Kubrick walking with a bunch of NASA scientists. And actually the scientists were part of Operation Paperclip. Um, so they were Nazi scientists and they were, um, they used as a cover for that photograph that, oh yeah, we let Stanley Kubrick come. And so because he was making Space Odyssey 2001, uh, but in reality, it was much more sinister than that. Um, it was for the Apollo 11, which I have said time and time again, is it was a fake moon landing. And I have, Michelin Rickless was also connected to Apollo 11. He made the spacesuits for uh, Neil Armstrong. I, I, I mean, it's like, but that's a show for another day. And um, it might be part of my Epstein Project podcast with receipts. Okay, so in Eyes Wide Shut, we do see a glimpse of the pedophilia and the sexual slave, slavery that, that's just part of this overworld. You know, they use the children um, as, as uh, initially as machines to, um, to abuse so that, and we see this, we will see this in one of Ira Levin's books, uh, Stepford Wives. Um, if you make someone compliant, if they look a certain way, well, you can make them look that way. It, then they just become uh, a sex slave. And this applies to uh, boys too. It's not just girls. You know, they obviously use boys because Jeffrey Epstein, I want to remind you, is a product of, of, of Gottlieb's um, Lolita program. Um, so 
Epstein, by the way, although he's an intelligence asset, theoretically he's dead. Uh, but remember, Alex Acosta said that he was told to back off because Epstein was an intelligence asset and above his pay grade. Um, we saw in the film by Stanley Kubrick, Eyes Wide Shut, the scene where the Tom Cruise character is in the costume um, store where the daughter of the owner, who happens to be Greek, and there are reasons for that, um, because it's, again, it's all interwoven. So you have somebody like Aristotle Onassis, who then married um, Jackie Kennedy. And Aristotle Onassis was part of, again, Michelle and Rickless's life. They did a deal. It, Donald Trump was involved. It's really interesting to me. I'm going to pause here and say this, that very smart people that I respect somehow feel that it's a Republican thing. No, it's a Democrat thing. No, if you want it, it, to make it very simple, let's just use the um, MK Ultra program, which was outed in 1974, as I said, by Seymour Hirsch, which led to the church committee hearings. Now, while a lot of the church committee hearings were whitewashed, we do know it was a real program, right? We do know that all of the documents were shredded. The only reason that there were 13 boxes left, 12 or 13 boxes left, is because they were put into storage somewhere and one person found them and brought them to the hearing, but they were just like cover letters, but all like millions of documents were just destroyed so that what was said at the church committee hearings and what was uh, discussed was very little, but what, what, what I want you to take away from this is that it's a real program and it never ended. You know, it then was moved to Montauk, uh, which is then the Montauk project, which I speak about in my new book, um, Creating Epstein, Bill Barr, Leslie Wexner and the CIA, uh, which I have paused for now because it's, it's, um, it's full of a lot of very new revelations. And I just want to pause it for the time being. I may be taking uh, pre-orders on it, but I'm not selling it currently. Uh, I'm waiting a little bit. So um, in order to uh, rise up in this world, you have to sacrifice. And so and I'm pausing because I, I, I do want to go into the history of the Dakota and the whole thing. But I do want to say that um, Roman Polanski had been trying to be, to sort of break into uh, the film industry for a long time. He had produced movies with borrowed money um, for years until, you know, and it was only uh, after he made uh, Ira Levin's Rosemary's Baby uh, that he became successful. And so um, I do want to now uh, sort of start discussing a little bit about the Dakota. I want to, I, I, because of my real estate um, background, and all, also I'm a New Yorker, uh, I, I like history, I like architecture, I've studied it um, for decades. So I might as well share this information with you. Um, Ira Levin chose that as the location for his um, book, Rosemary's Baby. Um, the building itself is really, it's, it's a fascinating building. Um, it was constructed, it took about four years, 19, 1880 to 1884. Uh, New York City was sort of like farmland uh, on the Upper West Side at the time and you know, going even further north. A lot of farmland. Um, so 
it would, it's called the Dakota because it was so far away. Because in those days, people used horse and carriage to get around. It was called the Dakota because it could have been Indian territory. So Indian territory, don't forget, this is their land. So I don't know why we call them Indians or why Americans call them Indians. Um, it's, it's sort of, a, to me, a derogatory term. These are um, actually the, the residents before the Europeans came over. Um, but again, that's a deep topic and it's, it's a topic for another day. But it was called the Dakota because it was so far away that it, it, they felt it could be as far as the Dakota. And um, the person who uh, created uh, this, um, well, wait, I've got a lot of notes, so I'm gonna just go over this kind of with a fine tooth comb. So it was designed by Henry uh, Hardenberg, who also designed the Plaza Hotel. So again, the Plaza Hotel was owned by Donald Trump for a short time. Uh, the no two apartments were alike. It was like considered the very first skyscraper of New York City. It was sort of the first rental apartment building in New York City. It was uh, created for the aspirational middle class, okay? So if you're in the middle class, people at, at that time used to own mansions. So the wealthy people of New York were still living in mansions. This was an apartment building, the first of its kind that was a rental building. And the rent, um, even, you know, like for a whole year, the rent for a whole year and what you got for was a thousand dollars. The highest it went was just shy of $6,000 for a whole year. Um, and what you got for that was the top floors were basically used by the help. And there used to be uh, these dumbbells in a lot of the uh, pre-war uh, apartment buildings. So sp specifically in the Dakota, they had dumbbells. And what these dumbbells were, they were hidden uh, shaftways where the food would be delivered to your apartment. So you would put the food there, the servants on top who did the cooking would put the food on the dumbbells and would lower it to the right apartment. And the person would open the door and would take out their food. Um, it also had a um, sort of like a gym. Uh, it, it, it had, you know, it had a very, if you look at the Dakota, it had a very uh, wide opening because as your horse and carriage approached, it went into the courtyard. So then the horse and carriage uh, would arrive and so that you don't get out on the street where perhaps you might be seen by other people, you had the privacy of going in a lot of these buildings uh, that offered this kind of privacy. The um, Museum of uh, the New York City. A lot of the museums were sort of built that way. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art specifically had that and it's been sort of changed around. A new building was built like that, but it was done so that the horse and carriage could just go in there and you got out. And, and so it's, a, it's sort of like an open courtyard building so that there's a lot of sun that goes into um, all of the apartments because of the way that uh, it's built. So the main entrance is, is arched, it's very large. It allows for the horse and carriage to go in, in there. And um, it's, it's really interesting. It's got uh, very steep roofs. It's got gabled sides. It's got balconies sort of jutting out from all sides. Um, there's a lot of decoration. Uh, it's sort of Gothic. Um, it's a mixture of Gothic 
and um, other uh, like Victorian, Gothic, Renaissance. It, it, it's, it's considered one of the treasures of New York City. In the beginning, um, it, in order to even get there, it was so far away, as I said, that there were, there were day hotels. And in fact, there's still a day hotel um, that remains in New York City that is now a museum. Um, so because it was so far away, now it's on 72nd Street, but if you're living downtown in these private homes that a lot, a lot of which sadly have been raised so you had the very rich people like the Morgans, you know, all of the industrialists uh, who had their own homes. Um, if anybody wanted to travel and those who became sort of went and, and tried to uh, look to see if they wanted to live in an apartment rental building, which would be less maintenance uh, than the house, you had to travel. So there were these day hotels for people to rest. And one of them was called the Mount Vernon. It's on 61st Street in New York City. And that was constructed in, in 1799. So it was converted into a hotel in 1826. However, it allowed people the ability to stop, have a meal, Later on, you could stay overnight, but in the beginning, you just were able to stop, have a meal, freshen up. I've been to that um, museum uh, several times, and they try to keep it as a the way it was uh, when it was used as a day hotel. So you have a communal dining area, um, long table, so that everyone who was a guest would eat at the same time. And, you know, a lot of those people knew each other because in those days, uh, the people who had money or the people who aspired to have money and, and were already working their way into that class um, kind of knew each other. Um, so let's, so in the beginning, when it became a, a rental for, normal people, um, it did attract a lot of musicians, a lot of actors. There are a lot of famous people that live there, like Lauren Bacall lived there. Judy Garland, who was also a child actor, lived there. Rosemary Clooney lived there. Leonard Bernstein lived there. Joe Namath, and of course, you know, Yoko Ono and John Lennon lived there. Um, Ira Levin wrote this uh, book. And in fact, I do want to give you a list of books that he wrote. So bear with me because I have notes everywhere. As usual, I have like 30 pages of notes. Um, so Ira Levin knew Roman Polanski. And it's my contention that um, Roman Polanski sacrificed uh, his wife beautiful Sharon Tate to a ritualistic satanic murder. Um, perhaps, in, you know, allegedly because of uh, his friendship with Ira Levin, who wrote uh, Rosemary's Baby in 1967. And in upcoming Epstein Project newsletters, I really dive deep into all of these connections to MKUltra and I dispel some of the myths that have been given to you by mainstream media and given to you like that for a purpose. So um, Ira Levin's books were, uh, he wrote seven books, a Kiss Before Dying, he wrote that in 1953. And then it took a very long time before he wrote uh, his second book, which was a Rosemary's Baby in 1967. Then he wrote This Perfect Day in 1970. 
I'm going to be discussing that book because that's an important book. He could not get that published. And there's a reason for that. It was only published, I believe. Um, I think it was like, it was only published in 19, I don't know, it was published. It was published recent. It was just like one of the books that he never got published. And then it was possibly published um, 20 years ago. I would have 20 or 30 years ago. In 1972, uh, he wrote The Stepford Wives. In 1976, he, he wrote Boys from Brazil. In 1991, he wrote Sliver, which is another important, uh, interesting thing that I wanna discuss as it pertains to Jeffrey Epstein. And then in 1997, he wrote uh, Son of Rosemary's Baby. Um, very briefly, Ira Levin was born into a uh, well-to-do family. His father was a very um, successful uh, toy importer. Now, when I was a kid, my very first job, teenager, uh, because I had terrific typing skills, because um, I was always writing, and uh, my stepfather uh, was the neighborhood doctor. Uh, he, he was Jewish, by the way, and his patients were... Um, survivors of the Holocaust. And so as a kid, I, I may have been eight years old, nine years old, he would sit me at the typewriter, these old clunky typewriters, and have me write these letters for um, a lot of the, well, his, all of his vic uh, victims, possibly they were victims, I don't know, but all of his patients, um, had been survivors of the Holocaust. And I, and I still remember the numbers on their arms. And these numbers would be numbers that were still re referenced in these medical letters that I wrote as a kid. And so it was by writing these letters um, to get continued treatment. And by the way, they were all addicted to drugs. They were all addicted to drugs, um, which is, in hindsight, it makes sense to me, okay, that they had been given drugs while in the concentration camp. And again, it connects to some of Ira Levin's work, which I'll be discussing, and it connects to MK Ultra. So that's how I learned to type um, at my stepfather's uh, office where he was treating the survivors of uh, the Holocaust. And um, so having uh, exceptional typing abilities, I could type twice as fast as anybody in my high school class when I took typing. And in those days, if you were a girl, you were encouraged to take stenography, which was shorthand. So in, in, in these classes, which, which you literally, they told you, if you're a girl, you have to take these classes. So by 14, I was taking these classes, but I was twice as fast as anybody else in the class. And so um, based on that, I decided to go and apply for a job. And, and I found a job at the Toy Center. The Toy Center is on 21st Street on 5th Avenue. That was my very first job and it was a part-time job. So um, I would go there from one to five because my school hours um, were until I believe 12. I started very early. I think it was eight in the morning. I can't remember. It may have been eight in the morning to 12. And then from there, I would go to the toy center where I would work from one to five. And um, because I had excellent typing skills. And so I worked at the toy center and the toy center is an interesting place because of course we had, Mattel had the offices there with the Barbie dolls that were part of creating a false image of what a girl should aspire to look like. And it's actually, it was the perfect cover because there was a lot of traveling. When you had an office at the toy center, Many of those were um, 
importers, exporters, just like Ira Levin's father, who also had an office at the Toy Center. And no, you will not find this on the internet. I'm telling you because I was there. And, and the, the traveling would be, you traveled all over the world to sell toys. So you would go to South America, you would go even to Africa. We used to have uh, people from Cape Town come in um, every year. There was a sort of like a, like an event, you know, sort of like a, and they still have it. Uh, it was toy week or something like that. And all of the new toys were featured. So you had the manufacturers there, but you also had a lot of the importer exporters. So that was a perfect cover, by the way, for, for spies. Perfect cover because you have all the traveling and also you have the propaganda. You have the propaganda that went hand in hand with the movie industry. So the movie industry, when they started to market their uh, related toys, they were made uh, and they weren't necessarily made on the premises, but they were shown. It was a showcase. So you couldn't get into the building unless you worked in the building or you were a buyer. All right. It was not open to the general public. Um, so Ira Levin was born to someone who had an office there, who was an importer. He had uh, a lot of money. And so he sent his son to... Um, I have all of these notes here, but bear with me. So he sent his son to, Horace Mann School. Horace Mann is where Donald Barr, remember Donald Barr who hired Jeffrey Epstein? where Donald Barr sent Bill Barr, a young Bill Barr. Horace Mann and, and uh, the Dalton School, very similar. In fact, you know, could be identical, except that one was in New York and the other one was uh, sort of in Westchester County. I think it was Westchester or something like that. So literally kind of the Bronx, but in a more affluent area of the Bronx. And the kids in Horace Mann, where Bill Barr went to school and also where Ira Levin went to school, uh, had to wear, a, you know, they had to wear a shirt and tie, jacket. They had, there was a dress code. You had to address, the boys addressed each other very, very um, formally. So, uh, it would have been Mr. Levin. In Bill Barr's uh, case, it was Mr. Barr. And these are kids that are 14 years old addressing each other. And, and these became uh, the children who went to Horace Mann, as you know, with Bill Barr. As soon as he never even, by the time he was in, in, in his last year of high school, he was already working for the CIA. You know, and that's information that if you dig enough, you'll find. He was already working for the CIA by the time he graduated from Horace Mann. So after Horace Mann, he goes to New York University, um, Ira Levin. New York University is where Jeffrey Epstein went. Um, and it's also a place that I write about uh, because that's a place, it's a whole, a lot of the universities are holding pens uh, for spies. So when Michelle and Rickless came into the United States in 1947 with his wife and his first, firstborn child, Marsha, he was put into Ohio State University where Leslie Wexner went to school, okay? Um, also in New York University was a Mossad agent by the name of Aviem Sela, A-V-I-E-M, last name S-E-L-L-A. And, you know, you take courses, but you're really, you know, you're there as a spy. So Jonathan Pollard, who everybody knows, about, so I'm not going to tell you who he was. He was recruited by Evian Sella. 
And Avi, which is the, you know, what everybody called him, and that's what you call someone who is formal name is Aviem. It's, it's Avi. Avi introduced him to Rafi Eitan, master spy, who was also um, Robert Maxwell's handler. Uh, Rafi Eitan uh, then took over Jonathan Pollard, and Rafi Eitan is the person who, along with Ariel Sharon, who was financed by Meshulam Rickless. So the Rickless family is very intertwined in, in this world, which is why I'm here, okay? Um, gave him the orders to go and steal the promised software. I'm sorry, the nuclear secrets from Sandia Laboratories using the compromised promised software. So as you can see there, all of these, what everybody thought were loose individual strings um, or tentacles, they're all connected. It's all part of the same thing. So um, we have Ira Levin going to New York University, which is the same school that Jeffrey Epstein went to. Epstein went in 1971 and he left in 1974 when he then began working uh, with Donald Barr. Um, but as soon as he graduated, almost the same thing as with Bill Barr, he, his father basically said to him, if you wanna be a writer, I'm gonna give you two years, do a try. And if for some reason you don't succeed, um, at least that's the story, that's the official story. If for some reason you don't succeed, you will come and work with me in the toy industry. Well, before he was even graduated from New York University, he was already employed as a freelance writer for none other than NBC and ABC. And we know that they're connected to the CIA. And how do we know that? Because in 1974, church, 1975, sorry, church committee hearings, uh, it was exposed that the that ABC, NBC, the three um, major networks, we only had three channels at the time. We had ABC, NBC, and uh, CBS. It was it was uh, said by Sig Miggleton who had become the head of one of these um, three uh, channels, and call them channels, networks is a better word, I guess we call, call them networks. Uh, when he became president in the mid 1950s, he said that by the time he became the head of the network, that there was a pre-existing arrangement with, this, with the CIA, meaning that they were going to put out what the CIA wanted them to put out. We no longer have that distinction. You know, now they actually own what we see. <laughs> As we can see with the films of Ira Levin. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, so, okay. Uh, he writes. Uh, so I'll go into Rosemary's Baby. Um, a little bit because basically he writes that in 1967. He already knows uh, Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski is told, I and I, I'm going to say that it's my, in my opinion and based on my research, because they were friends and they knew each other. And the job of, of the way we have seen uh, in the Jeffrey Epstein case, where the children recruit other children. The same thing happened in the Franklin child abuse scandal. Uh, the same thing happens with the adults. They recruit others that um, show the, an ability for duplicity. So if you want to make it in the world, you have to be able to be duplicitous. You have to be a great liar. You have to, be, you have, to have a tendency to be a psychopath. You can't be a complete psychopath because you're not going to follow 
the plan, right? But you have to have a tendency to be a psychopath. And so he, he noticed this tendency in Roman Polanski. And Roman Polanski had, as everyone knows, an affinity for little girls. And when he married Sharon Tate, she was very sad that he would make her um, have uh, swinger parties. In those days, that's what it was called. If two couples get together and you swap wives or you have uh, a foursome or you have something more, uh, which is what Jeffrey Epstein Island, Island was called, Orgy Island, if you have that. Um, so he, he introduced her into that lifestyle. She came from a very modest background. She's not second generation. She was married into it, you know, sort of like she was very pretty. She became um, uh, an actress. Uh, the initial responses to her acting ability were not great because she was shy. Uh, but she kind of fell for Roman Polanski when they did another kind of like demon-esque movie in London. Um, but it, very simply, I see Ira Levin as being the uh, architect of the Charles Manson murders of, uh, I mean, many people, right? Because it just, it wasn't just Sharon uh, Tate, Roman Polanski's wife who was murdered. You had Jay Sebring at the house. You had Abigail um, who was connected to the coffee uh, dynasty. And there are really interesting connections with Abigail Folger, uh, which I will get into in my newsletter. And you had um, then the LaBianca, killings and the wife of La Bianca, who her name is Rosemary. So all of this was planned and it was planned for a certain date. Uh, so for a uh, Rosemary's baby, uh, it kind of echoes the real life arrangement of Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. Uh, here is an aspiring writer with a wife, and I'm going to be getting into Mia Farrow because Mia Farrow is a second or a third, second generation, or possibly even a third generation of, and it's not widely known because for some odd reason, people believe uh, that um, Mia Farrow is, is um, not connected, but she's very connected, and I will be explaining that in this uh, conversation before I'm done. So we know the whole thing about Rosemary's Baby, this aspiring um, actor who's not having a lot of success moves in with his wife. And um, there is a scene where she is, uh, he wants to have a baby by a certain time. And that's very important. The timing of when he wants to have the baby is important. But we know that she is befriended by this very odd uh, older couple uh, who start giving her uh, potions to drink. And obviously these potions are to dull her senses and uh, to, but she, you know, she inherently knows that something is wrong. Uh, she feels she's, uh, they're going to take her baby uh, and kill her baby and of course, that's not really what happens, right? She ends up having the devil's child. A lot of people are, are unaware that the person who in the film and, and was put in the film by Ira Levin um, to have, to, to rape Rosemary uh, was, why am I just blanking out on his name? Um, but he was that Satanist, that very well-known Satanist. Um, and I'm not going to go through my notes to find his name, but everyone knows who he is. And uh, again, I may put that name underneath just to remind you guys of who it was. So he was in this movie. Uh, you know, the, the guy, 
I think it was Michael Aquino. Could it have been Michael Aquino or the other one? It was one of those two guys. And so, he, in fact, in his obituary, it says that he played the role of the devil in Rosemary's Baby. So it was either Michael Aquino or the other guy um, who started the, well, anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Um, an independent researcher in Spain, um, suggested that the timing of when Rosemary has her baby coincided, like if you go forward and the, the timing of, so, so he writes the film in 1967. In 1968, it is made and rewritten into a film by Roman Polanski, kind of fast, you know, that, that that's, Usually it takes longer than that for something like that to happen. But then in 1969, within weeks of Rosemary having Satan's child, this independent researcher in um, Spain, whose name I believe is Rafael or something like that, whose channel, by the way, was completely nuked, uh, but I have to find uh, a connection to him so that he and I can talk about this further. Um, and maybe I'll have him on the channel. He made the connection that a year after the baby is born, well, at least when, you know, where, when the baby is born, so it's not a year, it's like what, nine, 10 months, whatever it is. Um, we had the Stonewall riots in New York which basically was the beginning of the uh, gay movement. And while it's wonderful that everybody can live their life the way they want, basically the long-term plan of the overworld for us slaves, right? Because we're, we're the slaves at this point, is that they really want to neutralize us. They don't want us to you know, continue to procreate, continue to fall in love, continue to be couples, continue to have uh, a strong family values. They, their goal is to kind of just make us all robotic, right? Um, and so you take away uh, the genders. And so suddenly you, you're just uh, a robot, you know, so that we got that shows where the AI is going and um, the MK Ultra stuff is the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it took away the ability for those people who became split personalities or who were turned into sex slaves to end up having, for, for many of them, those who were not murdered, right? Um, to end up having a, a normal life with a partner to build a family, to have, you know, family values, uh, which is what America is supposed to be about, right? Family values. So um, I want to mention um, that while uh, Rosemary's Baby became a critical success, it also made a critical success of Roman Polanski. And as I said, he sacrificed his wife, his child, his firstborn in order to achieve success, which is basically the premise of Rosemary's Baby. And, and, and um, so it was, it was pre-planned. Uh, Roman Polanski ended up being charged with, uh, you know, the rape of a minor. And instead of uh, doing time, he left the country, he went to France. One of the people who um, went to his defense was Mia Farrow. Mia Farrow, at the time that she began working on Rosemary's Baby, was married to Frank Sinatra. 
Frank Sinatra did not want her to be in the movie. And in fact, they had only been married um, for a very short time. And because she refused to, uh, listen to him and she wanted to make this film, he divorced her. So that's why they were divorced, I believe in 1968. So they were married uh, for two years until she made the film. And then that was the end of that relationship. But I wanna get some more information that I know I have here on her. Uh, let's see. Where did I put Mia's information? Because I think it's important to know as much as we can about all of these people. I don't think it's fair to say, oh, well, this person's good and this person's not. I think we have to examine everybody who's in show business. We have to examine a anybody who, who has um, a measure of success has basically made a deal with someone you don't like, you know, become successful without making a deal. And hold, hold on, I will find, I need to find the Mia, Mia Farrow information because it's important. So give me a minute because I need to then open, open uh, another folder. All right, let's see if it's in here. Bear with me, it will be well worth it. Okay, there's that. Um, oh, okay, hold on. And I, again, you know, I go deeper into my research um, in the Epstein Project newsletter. I'm basically just giving you an overall view. Uh, so as I said, Farrow was married to Frank Sinatra at the time. He broke up with her because she was starring in the film. And later she defended Polanski uh, when he was exposed as being a pedophile. Uh, when she broke up with her partner, Woody Allen, who I have stated before is part of this whole thing again. And Woody Allen, we know, was a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, in fact, you know, they, he would go to his house very often. There's a photograph uh, of him and uh, his wife, who used to be his stepdaughter, uh, even though he was never technically married to Mia Farrow, uh, he was her long-term partner. Um, going into Jeffrey Epstein's home uh, with Jeffrey Epstein. So when uh, Mia Farrow uh, broke up with her long-term partner, Woody Allen, who, as I said, he was part, he's an insider, as much an, of an insider as Jeffrey Epstein, uh, when he was accused of sexually abusing uh, Mia Farrow's seven-year-old adopted daughter, Dylan, uh, well, guess who came to her rescue? Alan Dershowitz. So Alan Dershowitz, as you know, is um, one of Jeffrey Epstein's attorneys. And Alan Dershowitz has uh, always sort of gone to the defense of um, people who are on that side. So I don't see Mia Farrow as being on our side, although she is the mother of Ronan Farrow, who has presidential aspirations. I don't know if many people know that either. Um, in any event, um, one more thing. Uh, Woody Allen held a 1992 conference at the Plaza Hotel at the time that it was owned by Donald Trump. Woody Allen also put Trump in a couple of his films. It was sort of like an homage to him. Uh, and, you know, so that people who feel 
it's a Democrat thing. It's a Republican thing. No, it's, it's whoever happens to be in office knows about it, is part of it, has in fact become the president because they, they have been rewarded. So I get very disappointed when I hear really smart people who I think are in the know say things to me like, oh, I'm so disappointed that, you know, that Clinton or that Trump and they break it down. It's like, no, uh, you know, it's known that uh, Glenn Maxwell came out and said in Ira Levin's uh, book. And so Ira Levin is, uh, there's so many people that are called Ira Levin, but there's another Ira Levin. <laughs> um, who wrote a book um, where he had lunch with Ghislaine Maxwell and she basically, you know, yeah, she, she said, yeah, I, I have, I have Clinton on tape with kids. I have Trump on tape with kids. So when people find it surprising, and in fact, I'll take it a step further on the stand in the Ghislaine Maxwell case, one of those four women, we know that one was Annie Farmer, but one of the three who did not want to be named was introduced to Donald Trump. And, and he, uh, you know, he, he uh, put her into an apartment at Trump Tower. And it was by researching her history that I came across the Charles Manson connection. Uh, and then uh, Trump kind of lost interest in her after he met Melania, who again, Jeffrey Epstein would say things like, oh yeah, I introduced him to Melania. I happen to believe that to be true. You know, cover stories are created for a lot of people. For Pia Zadora, who became Michelle and Rickless's wife, a lot of cover stories are created for her, which people now think are the truth. Um, so anyway, um, Woody Allen did have a press conference in 1992 at the Plaza Hotel, then owned by Donald Trump, and Mia Farrow was represented by Alan Dershowitz. So these people, when they come to blows with each other, are then protected by um, their own people in their own crowd. Um, I want to talk about two books written by Ira Levin that are important uh, to us uh, as, it, as it pertains to um, what we've seen through the Jeffrey Epstein opening, you know, that, that the whole thing of that's given us a very big, at least it, it, it has for those of you who are open to looking at the truth, right? So for example, um, the Stepford Wives, um, and you know, you can just Google what that's about, but it, it basically it's about um, a lot of women who behave like robots. And in fact, their husbands do turn them into sort of robots, right? They, they, they all look perfect. They're perfectly uh, dressed. They all cater to their husband's needs. And um, Ira Levin got the idea, he, he claims, from um, Alvin Toffler, who, had, who was a, 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 an American writer and a futurist, and who had written a book uh, called Future Shock. Um, basically, the concept of future shock is, um, Let's say that it's, um, it was about creating the perfect companion and whether or not that would work. And it was found to be that it worked. Uh, I want to add that in 1964, um, Ira Levin wrote an article for Playboy magazine. So he was also a friend of Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner was also a CIA agent. Uh, 
connected to um, Bernie Kornfeld. Bernie Kornfeld also connected to Michelle and Rickless. Bernie Kornfeld uh, was instrumental in having a lot of tunnels dug under uh, the Playboy Mansion um, for Hugh Hefner, who was also, there was a whole thing with uh, children connected to that. I mean, there's just, there's just so much information, but again, read my books, subscribe to my Obscene Project newsletter. But in 1964, Ira Levin wrote an interview uh, for Playboy where he wrote about Vladimir Nabokov. As we know, Vladimir Nabokov wrote Lolita and I, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was very interested in, in Nabokov and had copies of his book Lolita uh, in all of his homes prominently displayed. Um, I have a lot more about Lolita, which is going uh, either in another talk or in one of my Epstein Project newsletters. Uh, but definitely um, this guy, Alvin Toffler, is another government connected guy. Um, as far as Kiss Before Dying, the whole thing about sisters, it, you know, it's about this guy who wants upward mobility. And so he connects with uh, a woman from a well to do family, and uh, she happens to have two sisters something goes wrong the first time. So he kills her. Then he tries with the second sister, something goes wrong. So he kills her. And then he has the last sister. We see within the Jeffrey Epstein world, the sisters are important, right? We have seen that a lot of the um, girls and young women who were lured into this were also invited to bring their sisters. And there are stories that have not been discussed by mainstream media of where that became, because we've only heard about the women who broke away, but you haven't heard much about the women who made, who, who stayed into what I'm going to call a cult. Because, you know, that's, it's the overworld cult who were, who were um, married off well, so they, the, the rewards were, if you do what we want you to do, you either succeed in your field, so you become a very famous um, model, with, there are many examples of that, very famous actress or actor, whatever the right terminology is for that, so we've seen examples of that, you become a famous singer, or you, know, you become a, a doctor, or you become married to a very wealthy person, you don't have to worry about money for the rest of your life. And so sisters are very important. So that film um, based on his first book, His Before Dying is, is about that. Um, the book that was not written about is, uh, this perfect day. It wasn't produced for a long time. And um, there's an example. There's a reason for this. It just had too much information about, um, let me just find it. Cause I have, you know, I usually have like 20 to 30 pages of notes. And sometimes because I'm always researching Sometimes I don't keep it all in one. So I'll have a set of 20 to 30 pages in one place, a set of 20 to 30 pages in another place. And if I was to sit down and try to actually write out these talks, it would take me about a week to do that. So I really appreciate your... Um, I appreciate the fact that you allow me the time to look at my notes. So I'm trying to pull something up. Okay. So 
So uh, this perfect day written by Ira Levin uh, is not, has not been made into a film. It's, it's considered a science fiction movie. I'm sorry, book. Uh, it's sort of um, compared to, to 1984. And, you know, quite frankly, I found some information about 1984 to suggest that um, you don't know everything there is to know about 1984. Uh, but again, I'm going to keep that for either another show or for my Epstein Project uh, newsletter. Um, so he wrote this right after he wrote uh, Rosemary's Baby. And it, it, it takes place in the future. So I believe it's sometime like in 20, 20, like, like the year 2200 or something like that. You know, it's just, it just takes place in the future. I don't have uh, the exact year here of where, where it takes, where it takes place. But um, it, it's at a time where uh, the computer is basically, um, in charge, and it's it's a it's called um, Uni, so that's sort of like everybody lives under Uni. All of the members of the society in every country, all of the the all of the different continents, all of the different countries, are now one. So if that sounds like one world order, that's exactly what he was writing about, and he wrote this in 1969, I believe it was, um, again, nobody really wanted to, to publish it. Nobody made a movie about it. And this is why. So everyone on the planet is, is uh, ruled over by a main computer called Uni. Everybody on the planet is given medication. Continual medication. If that doesn't sound like the MK Alter program, I don't know what does. So the medication is reduces their um, natural. You know, when 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 you you have no medication in you, you're naturally curious or you're rebellious or you're artistic, you know, you have aspirations or you have a normal sex drive. So under, while you're continuously drugged, um, you are, you have very low uh, sex drive. You have no individual aspiration. You kind of just go with the program. You are basically like a person in jail. You have to go with the program. You eat what they tell you to eat. Um, you all wear an identifying bracelet. Uh, everybody dies at the age of 62. So around the age of 62, um, people think that's, oh, well, that's the normal life expectancy. No, people are murdered. What happens is that when they start reaching that age, uh, they're given additional drugs and they're killed, they're murdered. Um, and so anyone who's resistant to the drug is considered an enemy. Um, so, I, I'm going to suggest that you read this because this book really shows you the new world order. But what's interesting, and, and yeah, there's going to be a spoiler alert here. So if you don't want to hear it, you should just not listen to this part of it. You know, skip forward a few minutes. So um, there is this one person who the book is, uh, it's sort of, we see the, that world in the future through the eyes of this one character. Uh, he decides, you know, he doesn't want to be, 
in, doesn't want to receive that much medication. So he starts lowering the dose by pretending that he is really too drugged out. And so they lower the dose. And what happens is that eventually he runs away. So he runs away and he, he thinks he wants to destroy uh, the, well, his goal is to destroy the major um, computer uni. And he has to go through continents and continents. And so he, and, you know, it, it, literally the whole world is part of the same thing. And if that doesn't remind you of what's the situation, which I'm just going to leave it at that, uh, then nothing will. But this, this was the end game for uh, all of the people in the overworld the whole time. And this is what this book is about. So Ira Levin had uh, knowledge. And I'm going to tell you how he had knowledge. I'm just going to squeeze, squeeze this part into it. When I described uh, the Jeffrey Epstein connection to the Montauk Project and to the MK Ultra and to Sidney Gottlieb's um, Lolita program and to the and to the Philadelphia experiment, a part of MK Ultra, because it was it colluded with the Philadelphia experiment, is time travel so that the people, and in this week's newsletter, there is a firsthand account of an MK Ultra victim in, who was turned into, a, into this world, into this sex, sex slavery, um, who explains while this person was in an underground, uh, military uh, base, how he was able to time travel. And this was explained uh, when I had my conversation with Professor uh, Daryl Hamamoto in, in um, my last uh, conversation with him, I believe of last month. Uh, I've uploaded a copy of that. He was generous enough to send me a copy uh, to my channel. So I urge you to listen to it. Um, so that they can do time travel. Um, and so when you can do time travel, you can sort of see what's, what's, what's going to happen in the future. And once that road is, is uh, paved, you can't change it. You can't change it. Um, it's, it's, you, so you can't, like, you can't say go back into the past and change the events of the future. It's fixed. Um, so... This character in Ira Levin's book, um, This Perfect Day, wants to just get rid of Uni. Once he finally makes it to where Uni is, they greet him. And they think, they, they say to, and, and really it just takes a lot of work and a lot of um, clear thinking, and a lot of uh, skills. And so they say to him, you know, well, you would make a great leader up here. And so that's really how it ends. Instead of him destroying it, anybody who gets there with the same idea to destroy it, because a lot of people want to destroy it, right? Once they get there, they're rewarded. They're told, well, you know, you can be one of us because you're smart. You were able to figure this out. You got through all of the barriers. And so then he becomes one of one of the over, over the overworld um, evil rulers. Um, so that book, uh, th there's a reason that that book was never really um, much made of it because it talks about what's pretty much happening in present day. Um, I want to discuss another book that he wrote, and that would be Sliver. And so just, uh, let me just pull up my notes for Sliver. Now I live in New York City and when he wrote uh, Sliver, we didn't have Sliver buildings. Uh, sl a Sliver building is uh, a building that's very narrow. We now have three Sliver buildings on 57th Street, um, overlooking Central Park, uh, south, and they're very tall skyscrapers. 
all silver mirror lined. And, um, but when Ira Levin wrote this book, we didn't have sliver buildings in New York City. This book um, was turned into a film. Uh, it starred Sharon Stone, William Baldwin. Um, it's about a, uh, a woman who works in publishing. Uh, again, there's, there's a, an aspirational thing. So she moves into this building. It's more of an upscale building uh, for people who make more money. And the only reason she's lucky enough to get an apartment in Sliver uh, is because a lot of mysterious deaths have made it so that there are vacancies. Well, she doesn't know who the owner is, um, but it turns out that eventually she starts a relationship with the owner who is played by uh, William Baldwin, um, who's Alec Baldwin's uh, younger brother. And in fact, Alec Baldwin is one of my followers. And there's a reason why a lot of the people that are involved in the movie and film industry in Hollywood follow my account. Uh, they want to know what I know. And um, I have blocked a few of them um, because I don't want them to know what I know. Uh, so anyway, as it turns out, uh, the owner of the building um, one day shows her a secret room in his apartment. And in the secret room, he has cameras that go into everybody's apartment in all the bedrooms. So if that doesn't sound to you like Jeffrey Epstein's homes, multiple homes everywhere where he had surveillance on everyone who lived there. I don't know what does. And um, so this was uh, put out as a film in 1991. And so in 1991, um, Jeffrey Epstein was sort of just beginning to have this sort of surveillance situation for blackmail. But I want to remind you that Jeffrey Epstein was not the beginning of this. Before this, uh, Craig Spence had his homes uh, retrofitted. The CIA had the um, experimental homes uh, fitted with cameras. We had the same thing with the Franklin uh, scandal uh, where everything was retrofitted with uh, cameras. And um, I've even discussed in, let's say on Twitter and in some of my previous newsletters um, that the stores owned by uh, Michelle and Rickless who owned um, Gimbel's uh, and the person who owned Alexander's. And I think, um, I think that um, Leslie Wexner also did this in his stores. They had cameras in the dressing room and it wasn't for shoplifting purposes, but it was for voyeurism. So those films were then put out into the black market. Um, you know, there's this whole uh, black market culture that nobody's uh, discussed, but um, I will say to you that a lot of the films that Jeffrey Epstein uh, made of these very famous people did make it onto the black market. I have confirmation of that. And um, not a lot of people know what a lot of these very powerful men looked like. Let's say, for example, nobody until Prince Andrew became uh, almost like a household name because of the incredible Virginia Dufre, who's put up the biggest fight. So brave, so incredible. I, you wouldn't know what he looked like back in 2001, right? I mean, I wouldn't have remembered what he looked like in 2001, but uh, apparently there are these films that are part of of the underground um, that were purchased by individuals who had a, a special interest and then were sort of 
hidden away into um, these porn sites. Um, so let's see if there's another uh, item so that I can wrap up. And if you haven't liked the video, please do. If you haven't subscribed to the Epstein Project newsletter, I suggest you do because that's really where I go into everything very deeply. Um, let's see if there's anything else here that I want to share with you. Um, so, so I, you know, for Ira Levin, he ended up uh, marrying a model. No surprise there, right? There's usually a, a correlation between, well, you know, you get a beautiful model as a wife because she belongs to us. So she's a sex slave, technically. Um, and I don't mean that in a derogatory term because initially they're, they're victims first, right? And then they're manipulated into this lifestyle. And then there's really almost no place to run to. So, so just to wrap around very quickly and go back to Rosemary's baby, that's an important point. Rosemary, there's no place for her to run to. So she, she tries to get help from her husband, who's part of the problem and is the problem. She can't get help from her neighbors who are part of the problem. She can't get help from her doctor who's in on it, right? So that explains why in the, in the Jeffrey Epstein world, we have seen doctors right? We've seen doctors, I'm not going to name them right now, but you know who I'm talking about. We see connections to hospitals. We see, so that in my own case, when I tried to call the police, when the intruder was breaking into my home, I called them twice and they never came. So for me, there was nowhere to run to. The building that I live in is connected. In fact, almost every apartment building in New York City, and I would dare say in every major city, a lot of um, our money that's connected to intelligence, that's not clean money, that would be considered, I would say, dirty money, uh, went into real estate. And so the owners are third generation connected to this overworld. So there's, there's, there's literally no place to go to, no place to run, nobody's gonna help you. So in Rosemary's case, um, there was nobody there to help her. Who was she gonna tell? Everybody was in on it. And that is the situation, frankly, that I find myself in. And that's a situation that a lot of the Jeffrey Epstein victims found themselves in. There's no place to run. That's why I work doggedly every single day to bring awareness to an issue that is, is not a movie, it's real life. Uh, it's portrayed in movies, uh, but it is real life. This is our real life. There is an overworld, there is an underworld, which is us. Um, talking about it and, 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 and uh, examining it and realizing that it's all connected uh, is part of the solution, but no, it's not like the Democrats are better than the Republicans. Everybody is in on it. Um, so I'd love to hear your comments. This has been a long conversation and I thank you for joining me and, and listening to me as I went through my notes. Um, and really you guys have been amazing. Uh, I have come under intense attack but you only come under intense attack when you're over the target. So obviously I'm over the target. Uh, I knew my information was correct because I've been, I've been dealing with this for decades. It's not a new thing for me. Uh, I think that no one really expected to see me on the scene uh, with the information and, and uh, that I had to bring to this. And then with that, bit of information, it, it helped me to connect the dots of this story that is part of all of our lives. Um, so thank you for being an uh, incredible um, partners on this journey. Um, I, I really, I, I can't thank you enough uh, because for me, this is very personal. 
All right. Well, it's Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project Podcast, and I hope you guys have a really good day. Bye.